All righty. So yeah, let's get started. Uh, so this is our second uh, lecture in the Apparn series uh, this year. Uh, as I mentioned, we record these and they will be on our YouTube channel. You can see the link there. Um, today we will hear, hear from Nathan Goodman. Um, Nathan is a graduate student at George Mason. And I actually asked Abby, Abigail Devoro, uh, to uh, introduce him because they were uh, grad, school, uh, grad school colleagues. And I think what Abby can do for us is give a broader context uh, to Nathan's uh, work. So you all saw the paper, um, but what, what I think we'll hear from Abby is sort of like where that fits with the, with the research program that Nathan is now uh, building. So uh, the floor is yours, Abby. Okay, great. I first met Nathan, gosh, five years ago. I, forget, I think it was five years ago and um, immediately saw, you know, that he was a, a, a kindred spirit, as we say. Um, and uh, so we used to talk a lot about um, entanglement even before there was an entangled political economy research network. Um, and I think that I could should characterize uh, Nathan's um, main research program as being deeply rooted in the work of Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, that's, I think, the, the central characterization I would give for his um, inspiration. Of course, Nathan is his own scholar, right? Um, and so he's worked on a number of, of different topics. Um, uh, political entrepreneurship and co-production uh, is wonderful. He's been working on that. He has a paper in, um, uh, in the Journal of, um, of, of, uh, of Private Enterprise. Um, and I'm oh, sorry, Journal of Private Entrepreneurship, I forget, JPE. Um, and uh, he's been working on um, entanglement between social institutions, um, self-interested motivations and social outcomes and how all that works, particularly when it comes to militarization. So this is a uh, militarization of police, um, uh, uh, prison, uh, this, uh, uh, problems with prisons and, and how uh, entanglement causes um, bad outcomes or more or higher levels of imprisonment and discrimination uh, against certain groups who end up being in prisons. Um, uh, he has been doing uh, working on dynamic process-based theory, comparing polycentric and centralized provision of public goods, social capital, and other kinds of social goods. Um, he has a strong uh, a core of, of Higgs running through his work, um, particularly the Higgsian ratchet, and um, how uh, 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 small uh, uh, small processes kind of interact with each other, like. Um, the self-interest of, of a border police uh, uh, and the um, uh, 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 and the wars going on and the uh, materials coming home from the wars and how all that turns into a uh, a, a very highly um, uh, militarized border police that's then sent against uh, the uh, sort of uh, sent into domestic territory rather than protecting the borders and so this is what he is going to be talking about today. Uh, all right, well, there you go, Nathan, if you want to take it from there. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually find that I'm not able to share my screen at the moment. I think if you transferred some of the co-host capabilities to me, I might be able to do so. But in the meantime, I can start with the, um, without the slides and then proceed. Uh, so um, in any case, the project that I'm presenting on today pertains to border militarization as an entrepreneurial process. And to understand how this relates to um, the entangled political economy research program, I want to think for a little bit about the relationship between, uh, between borders and different ways of viewing political economy. So if we were looking at borders through an additive political economy lens, as opposed to an entangled political economy lens, then what we would wind up doing is we would look at a system in which border security matters were a matter of we have this market process going on and a unitary actor that we're gonna call the state intervenes upon it. And so say you have drugs coming across the border, well, that's a market process in which you know, you have demand for various narcotics. The purchasers of narcotics are um, interested in procuring those narcotics and um, the sellers are seizing those profit opportunities and selling those narcotics. Likewise with immigration, you have various labor markets 
and there are people who are moving from situations in which the price they can fetch for their labor is relatively low towards situations across the border where the price they can fetch for their labor is comparatively high. And so you have these market processes going on and then the role that the state is playing is interfering with those market processes for a variety of reasons. So that might be in order to redistribute from uh, capitalists who are employing low skilled workers towards workers who are gaining rents by being protected from competition from immigrant laborers, for instance. Or it might be that the government is, is engaging in drug interdiction, stopping the flow of drugs across the border, and the result of that stopping the flow of drugs across the border is that we now have fewer narcotics in the country, which is a desired outcome by policymakers and voters who think that various drugs are too dangerous, too harmful. And so the additive political economy lens looks at the state interfering with various actions by private actors. By contrast, an entangled political economy lens would not treat the state as a unitary actor. Instead, an entangled political economy perspective on these issues would say that policy is not an object of choice, but a result of emergent processes, a result of interactions among a variety of individuals. And so rather than saying it as one single state, we're instead seeing a variety of public enterprises. So for most of the history that I'm going to talk about, this would include, for instance, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Nowadays, it would include Customs and Border Protection, which contains within it the Border Patrol. It would contain, to a lesser degree, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. It might contain the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, um, and it might also contain, you know, a range of nominally private enterprises, nominally private enterprises that are able to, so here's the slides. All right, so as I said, border militarization is an entrepreneurial process, and where I was at now is contrasting the two approaches we might take. So over here, um, we see the additive political economy approach. Triangle refers to a public enterprise, um, and the hexagon refers to a private enterprise. And so here we have the state acting upon a representative market agent, saying, for instance, you are not allowed to cross this border without the right uh, permission. Here, on the other hand, we see something that's close, that closer to the entangled political economy lens. And so once again, the triangles are public enterprises, the hexagons are uh, private enterprises. So we might have here the Department of uh, Homeland Security, or we might have a subsection of the Department of Homeland Security. So this might be Customs and Border Protection. This might be a contractor that contracts with Customs and Border Protection, say Boeing or Raytheon. Um, and maybe over here we have another contractor, say Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics. And then maybe over here you have an organization that Customs and Border Protection is interfering with. So um, you might have right here a um, private firm that wants to hire immigrants. And so instead of treating it as a unitary state acting with a decided upon policy that we have decided upon as the policy, instead policy itself and the implementation of the policy is a result of interactions among public and private enterprises. And so we'll see rent seeking by various interest groups. We'll see various forms of entrepreneurship, both within the public sector and within the private sector that pertain to changing the actions of various public officials and changing the functional rules of the game. And so this allows us to get more at how policies change over time rather than treating them as though they're the actions of a benevolent despot that's maximizing the social welfare function. And so unfortunately, I would say that a lot of existing research on immigration and borders fits pretty neatly within the additive political economy lens. Um, not necessarily with a strict representative agent for the private sector, often there's more process stuff going on at the market level, but at the political level, it's pretty static. It's they're interfering. And so we might calculate the deadweight loss from an immigration restriction. How much are we losing from migrants not being able to cross the border to do work that um, they're more productive at? Or we might ask, does immigration reduce wages? If so, for whom and how much? And so the implicit sort of upshot of that research program is, 
well, if we care about the wages of low wage workers in the US, how could we as advisors to uh, policymakers get them to set a better immigration policy? And there has been some public choice research that deals with um, immigration policy and border policy, right? There's been some examination of the incentives that shape immigration laws, but a lot of the stuff on the consequences of immigration and of immigration restrictions fits pretty well in an additive political economy framework because the policies are just taken as given or taken as something that based on what we learn about the effects of immigration, we might alter based on our new knowledge. And so there have been examinations of the incentives that shape immigration laws. So Kaplan in his work on rational irrationality looks mainly at the incentives of voters, finds that they don't have much of an incentive to study and learn things that might uh, result in them changing their opinions. And so they can indulge in their biases at very low cost. They don't have much need to update any of their priors because their vote is not going to change the outcome. So it's not like buying a car where you want to research it to make sure you actually get a car you like. Instead, when you're choosing politicians to vote for, you can just act expressively. And if you have an existing bias one way or another, and he argues based on survey data that many American voters have a bias uh, towards underestimating the benefits of immigration, then you're likely to vote for more anti-immigration politicians. Then the rest of the stuff that I have here largely looks at rent seeking and interest group competition with regards to immigration laws, but that's mostly rent seeking and competition by either those who employ workers and want immigration policies that allow them to hire workers who will uh, be profitable for them to employ, or labor union interests and other labor interests who are trying to get immigration policies that are beneficial to their own wages. And that's, of course, an important part of what's resulting in these uh, decisions, but it's not the whole story. It doesn't get you what tactics will be chosen for enforcement, for instance. It can explain why we're enforcing certain immigration laws, why certain immigration laws are put in place, but doesn't necessarily get you why we're enforcing immigration laws using drones and Black Hawk, heli Black Hawk helicopters rather than using audits where we're um, doing something where we're like looking at paperwork and saying, oh, well, this person doesn't seem to have a valid social security number. I'm going to go over to the company's office and issue a fine, right? So the reasons that we're choosing particular enforcement techniques are left relatively underexplained by something that looks at it primarily as a interest group competition between different employers and uh, employee interest groups. There has been some stuff on the incentives shaping enforcement of immigration laws, but that's mostly related to things like worksite audits. So the sorts of things that I mentioned where you'd be looking at whether a company is unlawfully employing workers and you might do a raid. So that might look militarized, right? That might involve a essentially a SWAT raid, but the choice to go in with, you know, military style weaponry is not exactly a choice that's primarily explained by that. Instead, we're looking at why do immigration laws get enforced against the firms that they're enforced against. There's been relatively little, by contrast, about the main topic that I want to address today, which is border militarization. So a shift towards particular types of hardware, particular types of collaborations, and particular types of uh, surveillance techniques and of uh, often violent enforcement tactics that's been addressed more by political scientists and sociologists and others in the social sciences than by economists, um, with a few exceptions. So Chris Coyne and I have a paper forthcoming in Peace Review on what's called the virtual wall. So this looks at the surveillance tactics and technologies used on the border. And in Tyranny Comes Home, Chris Coyne and Abby Hall um, discuss um, drones and how drones have been used abroad and then moved back home in a variety of ways. And one of the ways that they discuss pertains to the role of uh, drones in contemporary U.S. border security practices. And so what do I mean by border militarization? Well, I'd say it falls into sort of three key areas. So military hardware, so things like a drone that you might have previously seen flying over Pakistan or Yemen or Somalia on behalf of the US military or the CIA, now flying over Nogales or um, Texas or New Mexico and 
being used to surveil the border and to send information to a border patrol agent of, hey, there's some people walking here, it's suspicious. Um, they seem to be unlawful border crossers. Maybe we should send some people out in a truck to go pick them up. Um, another important form of border militarization relates to the adoption of military tactics. So training people using the same training that you would give to special forces, for instance. Um, and then there's collaborations. So things like we're going to have a partnership with this military base. This military base is going to do military training exercises along the border um, to help us beef up our capabilities for drug interdiction and for um, identifying uh, migrants. Uh, and then finally, there's the adoption of an explicit national security oriented mission. So if we look at border security, Initially, a lot of this stuff was under the Department of Labor because essentially an immigration restriction is a labor market regulation. It says it's unlawful to employ someone from another country unless they fit into a particular set of bureaucratic categories. Um, but now, of course, as you can see on this drone, right, Customs and Border Protection is part of the US Department of Homeland Security. The ostensible purpose now of border security is securing the homeland. And even before, becoming part of the Department of Homeland Security, border security came to be much more associated with national security objectives. And so to make this a little more concrete, I wanna go through some of the sorts of things that have happened. So transfer of military equipment to the Border Patrol has been happening in various forms for quite a while, right? So in 1945, the military transferred three Stinson L-5 aircraft to the Border Patrol, right? So these were aircraft that they had been using in the world wars. And now they said, okay, well, we're giving them to you. You can use them for border surveillance purposes. In 1973, the border patrol acquired in-ground sensors for surveillance, largely in-ground sensors that were leftovers from the Vietnam war. In 1984, we see the formation of the border patrol tactical unit. And so the border patrol tactical unit or BORTAC gets their uh, training largely modeled after US special forces. Um, and they also heavily collaborate with the United States military on uh, training exercises and a uh, variety of other things. And so this is one aspect of border militarization. BORTAC reflects the training and collaboration component and some of, and the sensors and the aircraft reflect sort of the hardware or capital side. Um, when it comes to the mission, as I said, in 1933, Immigration and Naturalization Service was created as part of the Department of Labor. So at that point, the purpose is ostensibly, we are going to enforce labor market regulations. By 1940, they're transferred to the Department of Justice. Okay, so at that point, the purpose becomes law enforcement. We are enforcing the laws of this country. Then in 2003, the Department of Homeland Security is formed and the old functions of the INS are transferred to Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Protection. Immigration and Customs Enforcement handles internal enforcement, so that's picking people up, detaining them, and deporting them. Customs and Border Protection is the checkpoints along the border. They're the ones who are surveilling the border, who are directly patrolling the border. That's sort of external enforcement. And so both of these are now officially within the scope of Homeland Security. They answer directly to the House Homeland Security Committee. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means, but one consequence of that is discussions of appropriations for this are discussed alongside other sorts of Homeland Security issues. So the people who are on this committee are going to be approaching this similar to how are we gonna fund the Coast Guard or how are we gonna fund the TSA? So it's different than funding a division of the Department of Labor because different politicians are in control of it, politicians potentially with different people lobbying them and so forth. And so there is a literature on border militarization, but as I said, it's largely outside of the economics literature. So in the 1990s, for instance, there were a series of operations that have often been called a form of border militarization that primarily involved beefing up enforcement along specific segments of the border. So we're talking things like setting up 76 miles of steel fence largely built with um, uh, reused uh, Vietnam War surplus of steel um, that had been used for like uh, landing pads and stuff, um, setting that up as fencing and assigning thousands of additional border patrol agents to these areas. And what you're doing in those 
settings is you're blocking off cities and areas near cities so people don't take those routes and instead they take the more dangerous routes. The, one of the terms for this was prevention through deterrence. So there the idea is, well, we're going to let the landscape be our ally because the cost of traversing the border illegally rises. The cost rises, so demand curves slope downward, we'll get less of it. But of course, for those whose demand is inelastic, those who cross, they're gonna be crossing through much more treacherous desert terrain, and so we've seen an increase in death. So that's a big part of the sociological and anthropological and ge geography literature on this. There's been stuff on just violence by Border Patrol agents. There's been stuff on Border Patrol's presence abroad. So that's things like uh, Todd Miller's recent book, Empire of Borders. Um, so this is Border Patrol agents going to a variety of countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Guatemala, Ukraine, um, just all over the place, uh, working with the State Department to train various other countries' governments on this is how you run an effective border security force. There's been some stuff on the incentives of private contractors, and so that relates pretty closely to what my paper's on. There's been relatively little on political entrepreneurship, but it has been addressed by Peter Andreas in his book, Border Games. And so he does address the role of political entrepreneurship in uh, the sort of ramp up of border security, um, especially the expressive role of border policing. So the idea that we're doing this in order to make it clear that you know, we are a state with a secure border, as well as the role of political entrepreneurs in doing things like seizing on particular images of here's footage of these border crossers. Um, don't you think that we need to secure the border? And so when I say that border militarization is an entrepreneurial process, what do I mean? Well, one thing I mean is that entrepreneurship, so seizing profit opportunities, both pecuniary and non-pecuniary profit opportunities, is a human universal. People are always seeking opportunities to improve their situation by their own lights, and they're going to be doing that in diverse institutional contexts. So a lot of the work on entrepreneurship that you'd point to is within a market context. So if you look at, say, Israel Kersner's work, he's looking at entrepreneurs acting within a context of property, contract, and consent. So they're seizing profit opportunities associated with uh, gaining profits in a market. Um, and one asks, but here we're looking at people, some of them nominally private actors, private contractors, and some of them public officials who are acting within a political context. Emphasizing the role of this entrepreneurship allows us to look at the process of border militarization over time. So since we're looking at change over time, this provides us with a useful lens for examining it because, you know, this isn't a snapshot. This isn't an equilibrium that we're looking at. And so, one other advantage of looking at it in this way is it can give us a better understanding of the costs of border militarization. Because if there are profit opportunities over here that people are seeking, then presumably there are other profit opportunities that they might otherwise seek under different institutional arrangements that they're not seeking. So they're seeking opportunities related to building connections with legislators and bureaucrats where they might otherwise be seeking opportunities to directly sell desired goods and services to consumers. And so what implications are there from this entrepreneurial process view of border militarization? Well, one, following the work of Robert Higgs, is that we're going to see a lot of political entrepreneurship to achieve desired changes during perceived crises. So when we have, for example, a crisis like the drug war or the war on terror, people are going to say, oh, well, there's, the public wants us to do something. They want us to act to keep them safe. And so I can really do well for myself as a politician by giving the people what they want in that regard, by giving them a stronger state that can keep them safe. It also suggests that entrepreneurship generates a process of change. And one way it does that is, in addition to entrepreneurship moving us closer to equilibrium in a Kersnerian way, it also creates new disruptions. Inventing the iPhone means there's now an app store. Um, and so there are opportunities to profit from selling apps. Likewise, creating a new border security bureaucracy means that you're going to need uh, various weapons and surveillance systems. And that's a profit opportunity for defense contractors. And so what we see as people seize those profit opportunities is a variety of forms of rent seeking and efforts to influence budget bills, to influence uh, the overall process so that you can get uh, more funds uh, so that you can get lucrative contracts. We're also going to see mission creep. So border patrol agents are going to find that, you know, we have these new skills. We did these training exercises with the military. 
we want to prove to our bosses that we're still useful. So maybe if you initially develop those skills to um, do riot control at INS facilities, but there aren't riots at immigration and naturalization service facilities anymore, you're going to be looking around for work where you can apply your new skills. And so that might lead to border security agents doing things that they weren't necessarily previously anticipated to be doing. And so the first of these big crises that we can point to is the drug war. So we're talking things like the crack epidemic and other sorts of uh, presences of drugs in American streets that's highly publicized in media and people are very concerned about the kinds of drugs that their fellow citizens have access to. And so this provides an opportunity for political entrepreneurs to say, you know, I am tough on drugs, I'm tough on crime, and I am going to help protect you from the scourge of narcotics. And so some of what was done to address this was there was a law passed that encouraged greater cooperation between police and the military, specifically to deal with uh, drugs. And so this weakened uh, what was called the Posse Comitatus Act, which is a restriction on the role of the military in domestic law enforcement activities. Um, officials created a variety of task forces uh, that placed Border Patrol agents and the military in close collaboration. So for instance, in 1982, George H.W. Bush spearheaded what was called the South Florida Task Force on Organized Crime. 1983, they built from that the National Narcotics Border Interdiction System, or NNBIS. And so these are collaborations between Border Patrol, especially under the, which was at that point part of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, various branches of the US military, the Coast Guard, to some degree the CIA, to some degree the FBI, definitely the DEA, as well as lots of state and local law enforcement organizations. So a polycentric system is suddenly uh, of law enforcement now has lots of resource opportunities and, um, for collaboration with federal officials. And we've got all this cooperation between people who are doing border policing um, and people on border. In 1986, na the National Narcotics Border Interdiction System uh, was then replaced with a, another project of George H.W. Bush's. Uh, he's vice president throughout all of this. And uh, Ed Meese, then the attorney general, called Operation Alliance. And that same year, 1986, Ronald Reagan declared that drugs were a national security threat. So drug trafficking is a national security threat. So this is very much something that we need the military on. And so we're going to give uh, people access to lots of military hardware. We're going to run training exercises at the border. We're going to um, open up opportunities for law enforcement agents and border security agents to consult with members of the military, to do training exercises with them, to go to military bases and get access to surveillance data that they have. Um, and we're going to expand powers. We're going to cross deputize people. So pre people who previously didn't have the power to conduct drug searches in border areas now have those powers. So um, you're cross if you're in the border patrol, you're cross deputized essentially to do drug searches on behalf of the DEA um, at this point. And we're seeing also big capital infusions, right? So the Immigration and Naturalization Service in the period between 1980 and 1992 acquired about 56 black uh, about 56 helicopters from the United States military. Um, now we also see in this period other more minor crises that are fueling changes. So in 1984 is when we see the Border Patrol Tactical Unit, or BORTAC, formed. And they were initially formed in response to rioting at INS facilities, but they quickly um, found that they uh, could be very useful in various counter-narcotics operations, both at home and also abroad. So they got involved also in uh, drug war operations throughout the hemisphere, not just domestically. Um, and so that's the first big crisis. Then September 11th, 2001, massive terrorist attack, right? So the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center, on the Pentagon, really traumatized a lot of Americans and got people thinking, okay, how are we so insecure? How do we protect ourselves from this? And so initially what we see is Immigration and Naturalization Service um, participating in a series of investigations with the rest of the Department of Justice called PentBomb. And so they are um, picking up lots of people, uh, lots of immigrants especially, um, to detain them and interrogate them. The trials of these suspects and the court hearings of these suspects are not open to the public. There's a lot less transparency around them because of the um, 
national security issues at stake. And so there's a lot of powers being seized even before we see the reorganization of these things. But eventually, um, in 2003, we see the Homeland Security Act, which um, reorganizes this. Immigration and naturalization service is no more. There's no more INS. That is now having its functions restructured into the new US Department of Homeland Security. And so we get ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and US Customs and Border Protection. And so we see these new organizations and they're under the direction of, or they're answerable to the House Homeland Security Committee when it comes to how their budgets are made, how policies and rules are made for them. Um, and so this committee, the Committee on Homeland Security, gets, for instance, a lot of campaign donations from defense contractors. And not all of this is for border security purposes. So some people are donating um, to them because they want, you know, contracts with other parts of the DHS. So you would also donate if you uh, might want influence over or if you like a politician's position on, say, how the Coast Guard is going to procure um, various types of hardware or on how TSA is going to procure things. But um, Todd Miller, um, in his paper, More Than a, More Than a Wall, um, looks at a lot of the influence on this committee and he has a list of defense contractors and says that between 2006 and 2018, um, these contractors donated about $6.5 million to members of this House committee. And so part of this is direct campaign donations. There's also lobbying visits. So a lot of these firms are hiring lobbyists and they're going to especially try to influence decisions at uh, the Homeland Security Committee. Um, and then we see also rent seeking by non-lobbying means. So I'm gonna talk about a bit more of what this might look like um, here. So um, border security expos, which uh, started in the mid 2000s, these are essentially trade shows, big trade shows and conferences for um, the members of the border security industry. And so we've got both contractors who sell various weapons and vehicles and surveillance equipment, and also people from the Department of Homeland Security, so public officials and uh, law enforcement officers. And so these expositions have a variety of functions. They help build a shared culture, for instance. Um, so if you go to one of these things, you're not just walking around the trade show and saying, oh man, I get to try out this gun, I get to look at this cool truck, I get to um, look at this drone, you're also um, going to be socializing with people, right? I mean, I've had dinner with some of you at conferences like the Southern Economic Association or the Public Choice Society meetings. Well, these same sorts of things are going to happen at any conference, and they're going to happen at conferences like border security expos. Then there are also events specifically for socializing, right? So there's an annual golf game, um, there's also an annual shooting day. So they have a shooting range, right? These are people who, you know, part of their specialized human capital relates to being able to shoot and use firearms in the course of enforcing various laws. And so uh, there's a shooting range event and there's a cover charge for this uh, shooting range event. And there's also a uh, registration fee for the conference. The registration fee for private contractors is much higher than the registration fee for public officials. And this makes sense. If you're a um, private contractor rather than a government employee, you're there to sell wares to government employees. If you're an employee of the Department of Homeland Security, you're there to make connections and figure out, okay, what cool tools can I acquire for my unit, for my department? Um, and so, I was once on a podcast uh, fairly recently discussing this and the podcast host said that this is like Raytheon ladies night. And so the basic idea here is if you go to bars that cater to largely heterosexual audiences, um, these bars are often going to charge a lower cover charge for women than for men. And the reason is that many men are coming to the bar specifically to try to make connections with uh, women who they find attractive. And similarly, here we're going to see a um, lower cover charge, a lower registration fee, a lower fee for going to the shooting competition, a lower fee for uh, participating in the golf game for public officials who all of the private contractors want to meet up with and make connections with and advertise their wares to than for uh, 
the private sector contractors who are willing to pay a much higher price in order to potentially get the payoff of a sweet federal contract. And so this serves a function of building a shared culture, building social connections. So you're building up social connections. So if we think about the first slide where we had that entangled political economy model, this is part of how you can get your you know, hexagonal triangle, your, uh, your, your hexagon, your private enterprise, to have a connection to a triangle that it didn't previously have a connection to, to a public enterprise it didn't previously have a connection to. Um, and um, it alerts others in the industry to profit opportunities. So maybe you weren't manufacturing something and now you see, oh, this other firm's manufacturing a thing. I got to get in on that. If you're a border patrol agent, you see, oh, I could have one of those types of uh, surveillance devices. I, I want that. And so um, we see all these sorts of uh, knowledge sharing that are happening, people being alerted to entrepreneurial opportunities and acting in response to them. And we see rent seeking by non-lobbying means. And so various efforts, expenditures made essentially to build connections with uh, public officials so that you can get lucrative contracts. Another thing that's useful here, that's important here is the revolving door. So this is movement of personnel between government and private business. And so, um, Part of this just arises from the fact that the division of labor implies a division of knowledge, right? So if you've worked in the Department of Homeland Security, then you have specialized knowledge about what makes a good product for a Homeland Security agent, right? If you're a Border Patrol agent, you have specialized knowledge about what Border Patrol agents want. And so to some extent, there's an incentive for these firms to hire you. Um, that's independent of any desire to build connections for sort of a crony uh, or rent seeking type uh, purpose. But there is of course a benefit to hiring former employees because they have connections to other people in the agency. So they can make a call to their old drinking buddy or their old uh, boss um, and say, hey, you know, we've got this new product coming down uh, the line. Would you like to um, maybe consider uh, procuring it? Maybe." Um, suggesting when the next budget bill comes up that this is a thing that you really need, right? And so these social relationships can be potentially quite lucrative. And so who I have pictured here is John Kelly, who was a head of US Southern Command in the Department of Defense, uh, went on to consult in the defense contracting uh, sector, then came back into government, headed up the Department of Homeland Security, was White House Chief of Staff under Donald Trump, Trump for a while, and uh, now is back in the private sector uh, working um, as a member of the board of directors for Caliber and International, which houses uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, migrant children, essentially, who have been uh, separated from their parents by the Department of Homeland Security in various ways. And so uh, he had a direct stake in making Homeland Security policy, and now he has a direct stake in the sort of private sector partnerships with certain aspects of border security policy. And he's certainly not alone. So Todd Miller in his paper, More Than a Wall, identified 177 Department of Homeland Security employees who had gone from working in the DHS to working within various aspects of these private sector organizations. He likewise identified 34 people who had worked as legislative staff at the House Homeland Security Committee and uh, also worked at a lobbying firm. And so, this is a fairly pervasive phenomenon within government. Another thing we see is not just entrepreneurship by private sector firms, but also creativity and entrepreneurship by people working within bureaucracies, right? As I suggested earlier, if you're working on a team that has special forces style training, right? Training explicitly modeled after special forces, that, that team in this case being the Border Patrol Tactical Unit or BORTAC, you're gonna want to be looking for more opportunities to use your skills. And so, um, you know, you were initially trained to deal with riots and um, immigration and naturalization service facilities. And then after those riots subside, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go to Latin American countries to help enforce drug prohibition. You're also in 1992 going to be deployed to Los Angeles, largely to Latino neighborhoods. You're going to make a lot of arrests, deport a lot of people, um, and largely be doing sort of riot control in this situation of civil unrest. More recently, in 2020, during the various uh, uh, protests in the wake of the death of George Floyd, um, 
we saw BORTAC deployed to cities like Portland. So when federal agents were um, on the streets of Portland, largely for the purpose of protecting a federal courthouse from various forms of vandalism that was occurring during uh, various, uh, um, during these uh, protests and or riots, depending on which term you prefer, um, right? We see uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, stationed there. And some of these people are with Federal Protective Service, which that makes sense. That's who you expect to be protecting federal buildings. But you've also got BORTAC agents, so the Border Patrol Tactical Unit. And so they've got these militarized tools and skills, um, largely initially developed for use in border security, uh, not necessarily something that was anticipated to be when it was initially uh, developed into their training, deployed within an American city for a largely American um, instance of uh, protest, a mix of First Amendment protected activity and um, uh, vandalism, right? And so now uh, they're deploying that there. Um, another instance of this being deployed to um, domestic events that don't necessarily have a clear border security element is that since 2002, the Super Bowl has been designated a national security special event, right? A uh, sort of event where we're saying, okay, well, this would be a high profile event for terrorists to strike. So Customs and Border Protection has had a big role since 2002 in policing the Super Bowl. So they fly, uh, they do a lot of aerial surveillance over the area where the Super Bowl is happening. They're conducting a lot of searches on Greyhound buses around it. And so that's been happening uh, since 2002. We also see that the drones being used along the border are not just gathering data for Customs and Border Protection. So they're also partnering with various state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies. And um, so how this works and how we know about this is because of Freedom of Information Act requests or FOIA requests by the Electronic Frontier Foundation or EFF. And so they have records of a lot of these flights and find that, you know, a lot of them were flights on behalf of other agencies. So this it might be, you know, we're going to do a flight on behalf of, uh, poli of local police near Standing Rock, um, which is where there was a construction of the, yeah, I'm blanking on the name of the pipeline, but essentially there was an oil pipeline um, being constructed. And uh, there were various environmentalists and Native American activists who were uh, protesting this pipeline on a mix of grounds related to opposing fossil fuel use and related to um, the pipeline crossing Native American land. Um, and so, you know, to a large extent, if you're a local police department and there's an influx of people to uh, do this type of protesting, you're sort of wondering, oh, what, what, what do I do? I don't have usually the resources for handling a large population, including large protests. That's more of a major city thing. So you might ask, ask for resources from other law enforcement agencies. In this case, the resource was, well, we're going to lend you a drone to do surveillance with. Um, similar usage of drone surveillance has happened in various cities this summer, in this past summer, in response to the protests in the wake of uh, the death of George Floyd and uh, the death of Breonna Taylor and others who were killed by police. Um, now, it's not just law enforcement purposes that uh, these drones are used for. So sometimes it's like various fish and wildlife services are being like, we want to track these wildlife migrations. Can we borrow your drone? But it's all these different uses. And the things to remember here are one, Customs and Border Protection has fewer procedural constraints on their powers to engage in search and seizure, because the idea is that the border is an area where we have more general permission to engage in surveillance um, and to engage in searches, right? If you're crossing the border, you're expecting to some extent to be searched um, in a way that you're not when you're in just, just walking around a city. But anywhere within 100 miles of the border is a zone that's within the Border Patrol's jurisdiction in this sense. And so they have heightened powers to engage in searches um, as well as to engage in surveillance. And so these tools that we've given the Border Patrol for these things, related to uh, largely a mix of national security rationales, immigration enforcement, and uh, drug prohibition are also being used by a wide range of other uh, departments and agencies, federal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, as well as non-law enforcement agencies. And so that raises a range of privacy and civil liberties concerns. And so what I want to um, sort of reiterate is first that Border militarization has been developed and maintained through alert entrepreneurial action. 
So this isn't just some uh, policymaker saying, all right, how do I maximize a social welfare function for the nation by sort of trading off different things like security and economic growth and wages for low wage workers who we want to protect from competition and the health of people in cities who we want to protect from narcotics. Obviously, it's a bunch of different individuals acting. And to some degree, they have these various policy oriented motivations. But there's also people who are seeking a range of uh, pecuniary and non pecuniary profits. So to some degree that for some people that's I want to make a profit for my firm for General Atomics or for Raytheon or for Boeing. For others, it's, you know, I want to get reelected and I would like to have a good, uh, you know, set of uh, supporters and of donors. And I'd like to, or, and to some extent it's, you know, I would like to go on trips. So, you know, some of the non campaign donation type lobbying is, you know, we're going to take you on a trip. And of course for, um, Border security agents, it's, oh, well, you know, I would like more opportunities to go to the shooting range at our annual conference with this person from another uh, firm who I think is pretty cool and who's pretty nice to me, right? So there's all of these different cascading acts of entrepreneurship with a wide range of different motives. And each act of entrepreneurship is going to create new entrepreneurial opportunities. So it's not just we're engaging in rent seeking until we, uh, do a, do a Tulloch style dissipation of this rectangle, right? Instead, it's also, as I engage in entrepreneurship, I am going to introduce to border patrol agents the idea that, oh, well, this is, this is the must have tool for doing my job. So next time I'm gonna want similar types of tools. Um, when you introduce a new policy, you're creating Likewise, a range of profit opportunities associated both with expanding that policy to address new policy objectives. The tool we used for counter narcotics action can now be used to police protests in major American cities. Um, and you're creating a situation where um, bureaucrats can act to maximize their budget. And so all of these different actions that are being taken creatively and entrepreneurially can help explain what Alex Salter calls constitutional drift. And so um, the idea here being that we have moved over the years from a situation with government being a relatively polycentric sort of federalism towards a system of um, relatively monocentric cartel federalism. And what drives that tendency? Well, part of what drives that tendency is various deepening connections between people um, at the federal level of the public sector and at um, more local levels of the public sector and in the private sector as responses to crises and responses to the profit opportunities associated with government programs make it more and more um, beneficial for people to um, tie their various uh, enforcement activities to one another. And so we see a drift from, you know, relatively little federal law enforcement activity to a lot of federal law enforcement activity that, uh, accordingly expands the various search and surveillance powers of local law enforcement as well. And so this means that there's not necessarily a straightforward, easy way for engaging in constitutional design or resolving the paradox of government, right? Roger Koppel has that paper on against design with several other um, constitutional scholars. And part of why you can't engage in straightforward constitutional design is even if you set up a set of constitutional provisions that are meant to set up strict limits to government. Well, there's going to be a desire to push the envelope during crises. Uh, people at every level of the society, both nominally private sector and nominally public sector are going to be acting creatively and they're going to be forging new connections and they're gonna be engaging in various acts of entrepreneurship that shift what the boundaries on the scope of government look like. So Thank you so much for uh, coming in and for listening. And I really look forward to any questions, comments, or feedback you have uh, either here or via email. This is still very much a work in progress and I look forward to learning from your questions, comments, and other insights. So thanks. All right, Nathan, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, just like last time uh, for Q&A, just let me know in the chat. That's how I will preserve the queue. So if you want to ask Nathan, uh, a question just uh, I don't, 
post, put something in the in the chat. You don't have to type your question. I'll just uh, follow the chat order for for the questions. Uh, and to get us started, I would like to ask you uh, about the role of competition. So, mm -hmm. um, one could think uh, uh, that all of this is just waste and creating a lot of harm, right? Mm -hmm. But the people who are actually involved in this, um, they try to be effective on some margin, right? Mm -hmm. They uh, they actually purchase this equipment, they select it based on some measure of effectiveness, and they actually try to capture uh, illegal immigrants and so on. So there is this effort uh, mm -hmm. to be effective. And I guess my question is why, right? Like why not just uh, spend taxpayers' money and buy this equipment and never use it? And uh, I, 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 my guess is that has something to do with competition for funds and like what's, who is the competitor to, to Border Patrol, right? Or what would, that, what would happen if they stopped or try not, didn't try as hard to be effective on the, on the selected measures that they, that they select? So that's a really good question. So one uh, paper that models competition among various bureaucrats um, is Breton and Wintrobe have a paper on um, the, um, I'm blanking on the exact uh, title, but it's, uh, it's essentially a paper on competition and entrepreneurship among bureaucrats within uh, Nazi Germany. And so this is a paper that, uh, to be clear, I'm describing this for positive purposes. I'm not trying to draw any specific moral equivalence or anything. Um, the, but their analysis basically looks at, um, in that setting, which admittedly is very different from the American setting in that you have a sort of monocentric dictator as opposed to voters who you need to um, please. But in that setting, you have entrepreneurship by bureaucrats who wanted to, in that case, ingratiate themselves to Hitler. Uh, and so they had incentives to creatively devise new programs, new uh, tactics for implementing the final solution, or in other words, implementing genocide against Jews. Um, and so they had incentives related to pleasing and ingratiating themselves with the leader. And to some extent within the executive branch of government, you may have that, right? So you may want to be able to get outside employment opportunities uh, within uh, or inside employment opportunities related to promotion within the executive branch. So you'd be potentially going from being a border patrol agent to being head of the CDP, to being head of the Department of Homeland Security, to being maybe like White House chief of staff, right? Um, so that sort of um, movement within is one potential incentive. Um, another potential incentive for acting in ways that actually enforce things might relate to um, the fact that there's potentially competition among different law enforcement agencies, right? And law enforcement agencies can even be ended. So the creation of ICE and Customs and Border Protection was a restructuring. It was the elimination of immigration and naturalization service and splitting it up. And so that was probably good for some people who got appointed to positions in ICE and CVP and probably bad for other people who had, you know, gigs that they were pretty happy with within INS and probably non-disruptive for some people who were maybe like on the ground border patrol agents who were just like, all right, well, my job's basically the same. It's just who I answer to has changed. And so part of it may be that there's, uh, that when there's a crisis, there's a chance to shake things up and you want to be somebody who gets the favorable end of those changes instead of the unfavorable end of those changes. Um, another might relate to the fact that there's some degree of voter feedback. Right, and so during perceived crises, um, there's a demand for agencies to do something about those perceived crises. And so if you can produce output that shows we're doing something, that's something that can then allow you to ask for more funds. And so if you just spend all your budget um, on things that don't generate any um, output, uh, anything that looks like output to legislators, they may be unlikely to give you additional funding. But if you can say, we detained this many border crossers, we deported this many immigrants, um, we engaged, we seized this amount of drugs. And this, this if you look at Peter Andreas's book, Border Games, you do see um, this being used as part of how you justify yourself and say, our program is doing something, um, is uh, people, were point to, you know, we're seizing this amount of drugs on the border. This is part of why um, you should fund us more and why what we do is important. And so it provides a potential way to get additional funding related to both proving your worth. So they don't say, 
well, screw you, Border Patrol, I'm going to fund the DEA to do this because it seems you're a bunch of do-nothing bureaucrats. Um, but also, it provides a useful way of uh, potentially feeding the view that what we do is necessary, right? So if you've, there, there's a way to, if you're a bureaucrat, spin either um, what you see, either output or lack of output as a good thing. So more drugs seized can make you look good because you can say, you know, we look, we're seizing all this drug, all these drugs. It's important. There's a lot of drugs crossing and we're effective. We seize them. We stop them. Um, and if you seize less, you could claim you know, this is because fewer people are bringing drugs across the border because we're very effective at deterring them. We were so effective at stopping them that now there's fewer drugs. Um, so you, but you will have to be at that point doing something, making an effort um, or else people who have an interest in those things on policy grounds could oppose you. Anyway, sorry for rambling a little bit in response to that. All right. Uh, uh... Okay, so next question, um, can, let's have uh, Abby. Uh, she put yeah, the list. Okay, um, this was a wonderful talk, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. You uh, made me think about a bunch of different things. So um, uh, Dick Wagner talks a lot about um, Coke Snowflakes, and I kind of wanted to think about this in terms of Coke Snowflakes. So Coke Snowflakes, uh, for those who aren't aware, are... Um, uh, what happens when you, um, I think it's you start with a hexagon and then you keep bisecting um, uh, uh, each end, uh, edge of the hexagon, and then you bisect the resulting edges and you keep bisecting, bisecting, it's a fractal. And you end up with something that has uh, approaching an infinite um, a perimeter. <laughs> an infinitely long perimeter because you can just keep bisecting, bisecting, bisecting. Um, and if you look at that in terms of uh, growth, uh, the, the perimeter itself is growing exponentially, right? Um, and so we talk a lot about Coke snowflakes with respect to the, you know, uh, the, the edges being opportunities for, um, uh, uh, for exploitation um, and growth of, of government or mission creep and these kinds of things. But I'm seeing here almost a story about two Coke snowflakes, which makes it even harder to be able to to, to say, do we have a way of avoiding cartel federalism in custom and border policing? Do we have a way of, of, of reversing that trend? Even with a single Coke snowflake, you have a difficulty with that because of the exponential growth. And, oh, well, you reduced, you cannot use these edges anymore to enter and exploit. But look at there's all these other ones that you can enter and exploit, right? So you, you end up even if you if you uh, block some edges of exploit, uh, some areas of exploitation, you have so many still left over that it doesn't really matter, right? Um, but you have kind of two Coke snowflakes here, you've got um, uh, the legislative Coke snowflakes, so the budget maximization, uh, entangled with the principal agent problem where the uh, risk takers are not the responsibility bearers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then you have this mission creep snowflake, which is, is encapsulated in your phrase, what we do is necessary, mm -hmm. right? And so you have one creating goals that the other responds to. And then they have certain measures that relate to the goals and they do what they can to maximize the ways in which they can respond to those goals. Mm -hmm. And so you have this, this bisection, this, this increasing exploitation of all of the ways in which they can respond to those goals. Um, and I, I, I just, I've never encountered a situation where you have kind of these two almost separate interactive entangled Coke snowflakes areas of exploitation within the agencies themselves and, the, and of course the legislative uh, uh, parts of exploitation that, that give the goals that the agencies then respond to. And I don't know if this is something that's interesting uh, uh, to think about. I, I'm a theorist, so I like to frame things, um, but uh, it's not exactly even a question, but uh, I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, I like that a lot. So I think that's a really cool way of uh, modeling that and of thinking about the sort of explosion of different um, entrepreneurial opportunities and of complexity. And you might even add a third Coke snowflake to that, which is going on in the private sector, including black markets, where each um, act of coercion creates an a profit opportunity related to evasion, which might relate to your own work on piecemeal circumnavigation, right? And um, as well as some of, I think it's, uh, it might be Leeson and Coyne's work on evasive entrepreneurship, right? And so 
we would see a creation of new opportunities related to the actions of drug cartels, for instance, as they respond to the actions of the Border Patrol and the DEA. And that response includes both innovations in evasion, innovations in um, uh, potency of drugs, right? Because you want both to have stuff that's compact and there are Alchi and Allen effect reasons for wanting higher drug potency when the price is increased um, at sort of a base rate by the cost of interdiction. And so there's probably a private sector response, especially in the illicit contraband market and to some degree probably in the illicit labor market that's also going on. And that's gonna have interaction effects with both the legislative side and the enforcement uh, side. Okay, excellent. And Dick, uh, I think you had a question. I see your hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Nathan, your uh, paper brought me back to my childhood and a circus act I recall where uh, someone was standing on top of two horses and rode it around the ring. And I can imagine if those horses started to diverge rather than running in parallel. And I have that impression in a way about your paper mm -hmm. in that I sense that you are trying to ride two horses uncomfortably mm. in that one horse concerns description mm -hmm. and the idea of entanglement. The other horse concerns judgment Mm -hmm. and what it's all about and what do we make about the system inside of which we're all caught. Mm -hmm. And let me say a couple things about each and then and quit. Um, on the description, Zafin, the claim about entanglement is that the entire world mm -hmm. is fabricated through transactions. Mm -hmm. There is no sort of dictatorship that mm -hmm. stands on Mount Olympus and makes everything happen. Everything is negotiated, transacted. Uh, Martin and I make this distinction between uh, a dyadic and triadic as, as a conceptual way because some transactions are good for all participants, some only good for some, but uh, mm -hmm. every transaction is, has to be good for some. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get into these things about uh, Border Patrol and Super Bowls. Well, isn't that a kind of a transaction? Mm -hmm. But uh, Border Patrol has drones, has people. Uh, uh, they can in turn develop connections uh, through the National Football League to support them mm -hmm. in other venues is, is a plausible thing. And if you were, I think one reasonable explanation, you might say, uh, as a way of organizing thought about why has government grown so much over the past century or so. I think you'd have to start from the point of view, it has grown so much because the, the returns on capital are higher in those kinds of activities than they are in the purely market-based kinds of private markets that our theories conceptualize. Now you might want to say, well, what is there that makes all that so? But I think the basic kind of implication of no $100 bills being left on the sidewalk is the same thing that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not an equilibrium theorist, but nonetheless, the kinds of notion that as a tendency of capital to move away from where rates return are low into where they are high is a reasonable, plausible thing to hold. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at some sets of activities that are expanding relative to others, you would surely have to conclude that there's uh, more return from those activities. Now, the entanglement would then ask you, the challenge then becomes how exactly do you explain or portray or describe those rates of return because a lot of those activities are nominally nonprofit, but we know that nominal nonprofit doesn't mean nonprofit, just means you have to uh, look deeper into it. And, but as pure description, it's just a way of trying to orient ourselves around the world in which we live and where you no longer have any kind of recognition of someone just deciding to want to go into business without getting anyone's permission. 
And uh, not only that, but everywhere you have a new plant being built, now you'll find some politician out there taking a shovel and breaking ground, <laughs> even though they're, they're not going to get any closer to the action after that. Uh, so there's, and that's uh, kind of thing. But so that's the, the one horse, uh, and I feel that you're uncomfortable with that because you also want to ride this judgment horse, and I can't blame you for that. Uh, but that raises uh, some issues, goes right very much was the core of Erwin Decker's uh, uh, book on the Austrian students of civilization where if you have a sense that, yeah, th there is a rhyme and reason to the developments we're experiencing, but yet we have a basis for believing, thinking that there could have been other paths if you go back to that famous old Robert Frost uh, poem about the diverging paths in the forest. And that, um, uh, and how we go about doing that, that sort of judgmental matter is, I think, a different task from the description. Mm -hmm. And I want to believe that you can do both. And I think you can, but not in the same model. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so you can have maybe a system where you can explain there's a logic to how things are going, just like you look at, for instance, look at old uh, Dickens's Christmas uh, tale. Uh, not Christmas tale, what was it called? Tale. Christmas tale? Whatever Charles, Charles Dickens' Christmas story was, where he had the three spirits. And so, uh, you know, uh, Scrooge asked the spirit of the Christmas tale to come, tell me, spirit, are these the things, the way it's going to work out, or just how it's heading now, and mm -hmm. that uh, I think we want a way of capturing both, of saying there is a logic inside of which is just spinning out, and it's a basic logic of economizing action, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's working out that way, but there's also a question, what I often tell in my classes these days, there's also the timological question of spiritness and so forth, and what different systems of order imply about this. Mm -hmm. And I think the way we're going down the road is a way of, you might imagine, we all become cattle being fattened up for the slaughter because we're well fed, we're well housed, but we don't do anything. See, the thing about socialism is nobody does anything. They're fed, they're told where to go to work, what to do, but there's no choice, there's no living, you don't have anything you do for yourself, you can say, here's my life, here's what I made of it for better or for worse. And I think that's important to people, I really do. And uh, I think uh, there's a challenge there, I don't know how to, I'm fussing with it, and I think we all should, but uh, you know, I, I think there is, yeah, uh, there is sort of the description and explanation of how things are taking their shape, but then uh, how do we judge it? Because we want to do that too. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think I sort of got into this project in large part, be, and I do this with a lot of my research on some of the more coercive uh, types of uh, governmental action is I have a particular judgment, but I also want to understand the um, underlying social processes, the transactions that are taking place, the explanation of changes and so on. And so the judgment sometimes bleeds into the paper and into the analysis and into the way I talk about it. But the main goal of the paper is the more explanation of uh, how these transactions take place. And so I think I've been trying to excise some of the more normative and uh, welfare analytic components because I think I've in earlier drafts have made stronger welfare claims that I don't think can actually be justified by the economic analysis. Um, and so I think I definitely see the tension you're pointing to and uh, I'm still working out how to, um, uh, how to tease out some of the details of that. So thank you for your insightful comment and question.
Alrighty, thank you. And next, uh, a question from Erwin. Yeah, Nathan, thanks. Um, I, of course, uh, from Europe, America these days looks a little bit odd every now and then. Um, we sometimes are even afraid that you are still the sign of things to come. Um, <laughs> but at least in the most recent border crisis that we had, this was not at all um, the response that we saw. Um, so I guess the most recent border crisis was the uh, Mediterranean refugee crisis, um, in which there was major bo border crossing going on, and there was also a political um, awareness and a political, uh, yeah, a, a moment of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, yet border patrol was not at all part of the menu of responses. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I suggested it at, to certain people that perhaps the, the weak border itself contributed very much to uh, the problem and that this created actually a sort of unclear system of rules and that this was a kind of arbitrage going on. But anyhow, I'm, I'm interested, especially now that, that, that uh, Dick Wagner has sort of made us aware of the, the sort of the costs and the, the rate of return, whether you have anything that you could give as a sort of comparison of the relative costs involved in perhaps organizing this type of border patrol or perhaps in the sort of returns that people are expecting from it. But, but it is striking, right, that it, we have this one ref, a very clear refugee crisis, which leads to no increased border patrol and in some sense a, a, ver, a very much a weaker uh, border crisis, although in the South, I'm, I'm, I don't know the details, details there, but um, uh, in the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's any sort of institutional or political factors or perhaps economic factors that you might be able to point to that explains part of the difference. So that's a very good question. I haven't uh, studied the European context to a great enough degree to feel comfortable making any confident claims about it. I know that there's uh, been some, uh, I think there's been at least one uh, just like policy paper, sort of white paper type thing from the Transnational Institute on border militarization in the European Union. So there is some adoption of some of the types of hardware and tools that I talked about um, there. But I think part of it might be the degree to which crises present uh, opportunities, but those opportunities are mediated through ideology and they're a result of, and they're profit opportunities for political entrepreneurs on multiple sides. And so especially a situation in which some of the most salient images of the crisis, crisis are things like migrants uh, uh, sort of drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, then that's going to be something that might give the advantage to those who want to engage in political entrepreneurship on behalf of liberalization, um, more so than to those who want to do it on behalf of increased restriction. Another reason might relate institutionally to the different structure between the European Union and the United States. Both are in some sense federalist systems, right? But I get the impression that the EU has a much less, uh, doesn't have as strong of a central authority as something like the US federal government. And so um, within the US federal government, you would have, you know, all these pre-existing um, federal police agencies, right? So the FBI, the INS, which is now, you know, ICE and CBP, now the Department of Homeland Security. Whereas I don't get the impression that there's a pre-existing tradition of those sorts of things on the central European level, uh, on the le rather the, the like central government governance of the EU. Um, and so the absence of that sort of thing might mean that border increased border security would largely be done by individual nation states. Um, and so that might mean that there's sort of a, especially given the sort of uh, op relatively open borders within the Schengen area, right? Um, and, and again, I apologize if I'm getting any details wrong because I don't know the European context all that well, but that might mean that there's uh, sort of a situation where unless you get large scale uh, buy-in by all of the states along the border, there might be sort of a collective action problem where you don't get much benefit from any border security spending because it's easy to route around by going through another country that adopts different policies. 
and so the comparative strength of the central uh, govern of the central governing body of uh, of the sort of overall federation may be a big explanation for the difference between uh, policies and approaches in the U.S. versus the EU. Though, again, I'm not. I have no expertise on the EU context, so um, take everything I just said with a grain of salt. Yeah. Just, just to add one final bit, I think the main profit opportunity, if, if we want to use that language, that was seized was by civil society organizations mm -hmm. um, in, in the European crisis. So they really mobilized and also organized ships, bought ships, uh, went over sometimes even to the African coast. There were even some, some scandals of them basically picking up refugees and acting as a kind of traffic, human trafficking uh, organization. But yeah, not to, no. okay, thanks. Interesting. There we go. I don't see any other questions. Uh, am I, is there anyone who would like to ask another question? We still have a couple of minutes left. 